Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Dimitra Atri to the show. He is an astrophysicist with New York University Abu Dhabi, and we'll be discussing his work showing how life might survive just beneath the surface of Mars, aided by galactic cosmic rays. We'll also look at how astronomers found a type of black hole they always expected to find, as well as one thought to be impossible. We examine the most detailed images ever recorded of the Sun, taken by astronomers at Europe's largest solar telescope. Lastly, we'll journey to the Moon, where investigators recently found hematite a mineral which forms from water and free oxygen, both of which are rare on the lunar surface. The first intermediate mass black hole ever discovered has been found by astronomers. These bodies have long been predicted by astrophysicists, but have never before been seen by astronomers. This body was created from the titanic collision of a pair of black holes with masses of 66 to and 85 times greater than the Sun. The larger of these two sits in a range of masses where astronomers thought black holes could not form. Typically, such stars should be destroyed as they collapse preventing the formation of a black hole. Researchers are now seeking to understand how this body formed, although an earlier merger between black holes may be a possibility. The black hole produced from this recently discovered collision has a mass roughly 120 times greater than the Sun. Researchers at the Gregor Telescope in the Canary Islands have released new images of the Sun, revealing our parent star in unprecedented detail. While Spain was closed down in March due to the coronavirus, astronomers refurbished this instrument, the largest solar telescope in Europe. The images show convection cells on the surface of the Sun resembling popcorn, and they repeat reveal details in spots as small as 50 kilometers or just over 30 miles across. The Sun is just now passing a solar sunspot minimum, meaning we should see more of these features over the next few years. <clears throat> the familiar product of water, oxygen, and iron that we know as rust forms readily on Earth. However, with limited water supplies and little free oxygen, this process should be impossible on the Moon. However, a new study taken of data taken more than a decade ago by an Indian lunar orbiter reveals large quantities of hematite, a form of iron oxide on the lunar surface. Investigators believe the mineral may form from water within the lunar crust impacted by dust traveling away from the sun at tremendous speeds. This week, we are joined by Dr. Dimitra Atri of New York University Abu Dhabi, discussing his work revealing that life forms might survive just under the surface of Mars using galactic cosmic rays to drive the mechanisms of life. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Dimitra Atri. He is an astrophysicist at the Center for Space Science at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Welcome to the show, Demetra. Thanks, Jim. Good to be here. Excellent. 
So uh, you recently did some really interesting research on uh, the possibilities of life under the surface of Mars. Can you tell us a little bit about what you studied and what it is that you found? Yeah, so, uh, so far as we know that there has been no detection of life on the surface of Mars. Several missions have gone there, looked for signs of life. Uh, the problem is the radiation dose on the surface of Mars is extremely high. Mars does not have an intrinsic magnetic field. The atmosphere is very, very thin. And so the flux of galactic cosmic rays, uh, solar protons, ultraviolet radiation, uh, so these charged particles and photons, they directly uh, bombard the surface. So any kind of stable life uh, cannot survive on the surface. But the surf subsurface has not been explored yet. Uh, most of the radiation, if you look at the ultraviolet radiation that is blocked, and so it does not penetrate in, in deeper below the surface. But if you look at energetic protons uh, coming from galactic cosmic rays, they are so energetic that they can penetrate several meters deep. And uh, as they penetrate deeper, uh, the intensity or the amount of energy or the amount of damage that they cause goes down. So it is not that lethal to life, but at the same time, it can induce chemistry uh, below the surface. So it can be an optimum zone below the surface, about uh, between one to two meters uh, below the surface, where the radiation dose is not that high that it is going to kill life, but it is good enough to induce some kind of uh, chemical activity, chemical disequilibrium, the technical term, uh, which could be used for metabolic activity. And so there is a possibility that if uh, there was life on the on Mars at some point in time, those uh, microorganisms called extremophiles, which survive in extreme environments, they could still survive. Huh. This, that's really fascinating. So would, the, would these extremophiles be um, using these galactic cosmic rays directly as a source of energy or is this just helping to drive or catalyze reactions? Yeah, so there's, yeah, yeah. So there's no way to directly use uh, these high energy protons, but it is an indirect use. So it is like cooking something in a microwave oven that you put something and then you have the heat and that starts uh, the chemical reactions same way. You have the Martian regolith uh, there, and these charged particles induce uh, chemistry. So you have tons of electrons produced, and chemistry is all about uh, the flow of electrons. So just like in case of photosynthesis, you have sunlight starting a series of chemical reactions so that electrons start flowing and ATP is formed. Uh, same way, uh, galactic cosmic rays will start a series of chemical reactions and produce, uh, uh, for example, hydrogen. Water has, uh, sorry, Mars has traces of water, and those can be broken down into hydrogen. Uh, it will produce electrons again, which are useful for um, metabolic activity. And of course, you know, we suspect now or uh, pretty good signs that there are little, you know, th thimble sized deposits of water just underneath the surface in this area that we're talking about. So are they living within these pockets of water and how, how are their life processes working? With yeah, so most likely uh, you, you need pockets uh, in Mars where you have sufficient amount of uh, nutrients. So we don't know what life there might look like, but from uh, uh, the microbial point of view from the life there, uh, any pockets where you have these nutrients, so some amount of water, uh, some, some of these chemicals such as sulfates, which are useful, uh, hydrogen, uh, oxygen, these are very useful for biology. So wherever the concentration is high, uh, that is where uh, these microbes can survive. And the European Space Agency and Roscosmos are planning to send a mission called the ExoMars mission. Uh, it was supposed to be launched 
this year, but just like everything uh, is uh, going in a <laughs> negative direction this year. So the mission got uh, delayed and so it will be launched in 22 and hopefully land on the Martian surface on 23. It has a drill capable of uh, penetrating two meters below the surface of Mars, about six feet. And uh, one of the mission objectives is to look for signs of life. So this is where this uh, hypothesis can be tested. Right. So um, this spacecraft that is going the Rosalind Franklin rover, the ExoMars 2022 20, mission, um, what are we hoping to accomplish with that? What are the capabilities of that spacecraft? Yeah, so the Rosalind Franklin rover has a number of instruments. One of their main objectives is to look at signs of life. And so it has uh, several imaging instruments that can look uh, with very high resolution, which can look for uh, even um, uh, microbial life. It has instruments on board uh, to study possible uh, organic substances uh, below the surface. And so both chemical uh, as well as uh, uh, imaging capabilities, which could look for uh, biosignatures. Hmm. So what sort of life might we be looking for? Um, what, you know, what, you know, what sort of living things could be driven by this radiation? Could be anything as complicated as bacteria, or are we talking simple life forms like viruses? Yeah, yeah, so it is very difficult to say. But one thing is for sure that because it is such an extreme environment, uh, the radiation itself is high. So any kind of organism will have to spend a lot of energy uh, repairing damage. Mm. So you have constant, so not only you are extracting energy from all this radiation, you are also exposed to this radiation. Right. And you have to use a part of that energy to repair all the damage. And so your energy budget itself is very, very limited. And so it has to be very simplistic kind of life if, if it exists at all. Hmm. This is really sort of fascinating. And I think, I mean, is this the sort of, are we basing the idea on DNA based life? or something like it? Are we saying, you know, if carbon is being carbon, you know, this is how it's going to react with these chemicals or are we, is this a more generalized Yeah, idea? so it is, yeah, yeah, it is very difficult to say. Uh, so this idea is more of uh, the physical environment that you have a physical environment where you have this radiation inducing chemistry, which could be used by life. And we know that on Earth, we have a bacterium uh, D sulfuridis odiviator. I call it the gold mine bug. It is, fine. It is found 2.8 kilometers deep in a South African gold mine. And it is surrounded by radioactive rocks. So it works on a similar mechanism. Uh, so what I have done is I have taken this idea and I have uh, used it uh, to work with galactic cosmic rays on Mars. And so the kind of life that we know with uh, our kind of DNA, carbon life, it can exist in such extreme environments. But who knows about other types of life? I mean, it is still an open question and very fascinating uh, subject. And uh, yeah. So is this um, the type of process that you'd expect to find just on Mars or could this type of thing be happening, let's say, at the polar ice caps of the moon, say, or in the oceans of Europa or the hy hydrocarbon, you know, seas of Titan? Right. So anywhere where you have a thin atmosphere, so like I said earlier that uh, Mars had a, has a very thin atmosphere, so you have galactic cosmic rays, uh, they are everywhere in the galaxy. And so planets are exposed to them. So for example, if you look at Earth or Venus, we have a very significant shielding from the atmosphere. So if you, if I were to put a cosmic ray detector here, you still have a flux of cosmic rays that you can see, but the amount is so small that it does not have any noticeable impact on life. Right. 
Mm -hmm. So you need a thin atmosphere on a planet so that there is very little shielding and you have a high dose of radiation. And anywhere uh, in the solar system, for example, our moon uh, or on Europa, where you have negligible atmospheres, you can have these galactic cosmic rays penetrating several meters below the surface and uh, start uh, this chemical reaction. Now, I didn't, I didn't talk about other planetary objects in this paper because there was no way of testing it directly. With Mars, there's a way of going and directly uh, measuring these things. So that was fascinating. It's fascinating. So is there, um, obviously, if we, we know very little about any life that might be there, but one of the you know hallmarks of life is waste production. And so a lot of the, you know a lot of astronomers that we've had in the show lately are, are looking at uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets uh, mm -hmm. for signs of telltale chemical signs of life, um, methane mm -hmm. among them. But are, do we have any clue of any sort of other signs we can look for in addition to just drilling into the rock? Do we have any telltale chemical signatures to look for? Yeah, excellent question. Like, uh, so as you just uh, mentioned, methane, uh, methane detection is still highly controversial. You have uh, one side saying that they detected methane, other side that there is no methane. So uh, still we don't know. Uh, other than that, I don't know what would be uh, something that would be stable enough to stay on the surface of Mars uh, for that long. Because even if this life, which uh, will utilize very minimal resources available to it, it might release some byproducts in minuscule amounts, but it will be damaged most likely because of high exposure levels on the surface. So it is extremely difficult to say, but it is still an open question and we don't know what to look for. Hmm. And, um... Of course, you know, we have ExoMars, as you mentioned, ExoMars uh, 2022 headed with the Rosalind Franklin um, rover, but we also have uh, the United Arab Emir Emirates is sending the Hope Orbiter to go yeah. search and study the Martian atmosphere. Yeah. Um, what do you hope to get out of that instrument as well as other instruments that are uh, headed towards Mars? Yeah, so HOPE mission is the first uh, interplanetary mission by uh, the UAE. It's a very big deal here. Uh, just the other day, I saw on the back of uh, a bus saying that HOPE mission has completed uh, 100 million kilometers. So it is good to see even the general public uh, being enthusiastic about uh, the mission. And uh, yeah, I, I meet people everywhere asking me about the HOPE mission. And so it is an orbiter with three instruments on board uh, looking at uh, uh, the atmosphere of Mars. And my ma main motivation uh, with uh, the HOPE mission is to study the escape rate of gases from the Martian atmosphere. So as we know from earlier missions, uh, in particular with NASA's MAVEN mission, how solar activity uh, interact how solar activity impacts Mars and how it increases the escape rate of gases from uh, the Martian atmosphere. It will be studied in great detail uh, with the mission. And once we understand the physics of how uh, solar activity impacts the escape rate of gases, then we can take that back in time and figure out how exactly Mars lost a majority of its atmosphere. Uh, because now there is a general consensus that Mars was very Earth-like uh, several billion years ago with uh, liquid water on its surface. And over a period of time, its atmosphere eroded. And so that is one of the big questions that will be answered with the HOPE mission. Hmm. And where do you, uh, where do you uh, most, where do you uh, expect, most expect to find any signs of life? When we're talking Gale Crater, are we talking anywhere with deltas, you know, from former river bends, or where? Where would you? Where would you look? 
Yeah, so anywhere where you have a large amount of water, like we see on Earth, that wherever you have water, you have life. So anywhere close to water bodies would be a good place to look for life. That's great. And what are you most uh, hoping to see uh, experiment-wise, uh, especially from ExoMars, but also any other instruments that are up there? Yeah, with Mars, uh, see, so far all our Martian exploration has been on the surface. And uh, every time a new mission goes there with new instruments, more capabilities, we learn something new about Mars. So having organics on the surface of Mars used to be a controversial idea, but now it is very well known. Uh, we know uh, in great detail what kind of organic substances uh, are found on the surface. Unestimates based on what we see on the surface. And uh, it happens uh, every time that you have a new instrument and it will change our understanding of uh, uh, what we are looking for and so the most unexpected thing is the most exciting part uh, mm -hmm. with exomars of course final question we have the uh, you know we always have some tense moments as uh rovers and landers are going to touch down on mars yeah have you made your plans yet for those seven minutes of terror <laughs> <laughs> i generally uh, stay away from them because i get very nervous uh, when they are landing so yeah <laughs> that's great and uh, thank you so much for being on the show yeah thanks a lot james for having me yeah good thank to talk you. to you Oh, great. And that was Dr. Dimitra Atri from the from New York University, Abu Dhabi. Next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we will be joined by Dr. Christopher Berry, astrophysicist at Northwestern University. He is one of the researchers on the recent discovery of the first intermediate mass black hole ever seen. And he will tell us about how this discovery was made. We are also designing a new virtual classroom, providing viewers a chance to learn more about space and astronomy in a highly interactive, media-rich environment. Search for The Cosmic Companion on Kickstarter or Indiegogo to learn more about this project. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with The Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.